So I want to talk uh, more about your process. I want to talk about your origins to how you got into publishing, all that good stuff. Uh, but probably the best way to go about that is to start with a specific book like the recently available Fenris and Mott. Hey, there's a copy. The audience can be picking up their copy right now. Get, contact your library. They've probably got a copy. If they don't, ask them to get one. You'd be in good shape. So uh, true to my word, I will not make you sit through me summarizing your book. Uh, what does esteemed audience need to know about Fenris and Mott? It is what I call a contemporary fantasy. It takes place in our recognizable world at our recognizable time. Uh, in this case, I actually put it in Culver City, California, which is a suburb outside Los Angeles. Uh, it's my hometown. It's where I grew up. Um, so our main character is a fifth grader going into sixth grade. It's, it takes place in the summer between. Her name is Mott. That's uh, short for Martha. Um, she's recently moved to California. She's been cut off from the life she knew, uh, her friends, her partner that makes YouTube root beer videos with her. Um, her mom came out on the promise of a job and uh, that job is gonna be, uh, help them able to afford a nice apartment with a koi pond and Mott was gonna be able to get a dog. Then her mom doesn't get that job and they kind of have to downgrade their expectations. So she's not going to get a dog. At the beginning of the book, that's her biggest heartbreak. She happens to find uh, an abandoned puppy uh, in a recycle bin in an alley. And Mott makes the promise that she's, no matter what, going to take care of that dog. That dog is going to be okay. Mott understands that that means, really, she's going to have to take that dog to a shelter where it will be taken care of and adopted out, uh, which is a difficult decision for Mott, but that's the promise she made. The, the puppy turns out to actually not be a dog puppy. It's actually a baby wolf. And as it happens, it's not just any baby wolf, it's Fenris, which is the wolf from Norse mythology, uh, who is destined to lay waste to uh, cities and, and countryside and uh, kill Odin, uh, eat Odin, who is the god's chief and ultimately eat the moon. And this is all part of Ragnarok. Ragnarok is the Norse myth of how the world ends. And this wolf is an important part of that prophecy. So now Maud has made a promise to take care of that dog, to take care of what is now actually a wolf, a wolf with massive destructive capabilities, even though it's still just a tiny little white fluff ball and it's adorable. Um, so what does she do to keep that promise? Will she break that promise? Can she protect the dog, the wolf, uh, who's being pursued by Norse gods? Can she pre prevent the wolf from destroying the world? And uh, can she find um, happiness and joy along the way? She's teamed up with uh, a Valkyrie, a Norse warrior woman. This is a young Valkyrie, still a girl. Um, so there's uh, a newfound friendship. There's weird encounters with very strange Norse personages from Norse mythology. And there are all the portents of Ragnarok happening, including tidal waves and wildfires and earthquakes and uh, strife among men and women and battles uh, all in Los Angeles, uh, the Los Angeles area. So that's basically what it's about. So I was curious as I was reading this, if you were to eat Odin, if you're a wolf and you, I assume a, a monster wolf as described in mythology would enjoy eating, consuming flesh. Uh, it just doesn't get much better, I imagine, than than Odin, you know, the god. I mean, that's got to be like the best meal around. It's the probably moment, pretty good. It's, very, it, it's like, you know, it's like eating sand after the most delicious steak you ever had. But <laughs> it's, just, it's just something that struck me. I feel like that order should be reversed. Suffer through the moon and then you can enjoy Odin. <laughs> well, I feel that um, my dogs eat everything and they do not, do not seem to have, I mean, they love to eat their dog food. They love chicken. They love salmon. They also love wood. You know, they love grass. Uh, they love um, poop. Uh, they're not the most discerning palates. Our, do our, our dogs, when, our older dog, Dozer, the first week we had him, I found myself removing a, uh, a severed bird's leg out of his mouth. And I'm just like, why would you eat that? Why would you eat a severed bird's leg? 
And I realized like, yeah, these dogs just eat everything. And Fenris is maybe like, you know, the most uh, epic depiction of that dog trait. He'll eat anything. Uh, he eats an A-level, A-list movie actor. He eats trucks. He eats trees. Uh, he eats a water tower. Um, you know, Odin is probably just a little snack along the way to eating the rest of the universe. Well, let's see from that perspective. I the moon would look like a nice, big, delish, uh, delicious treat, at least as good as a severed bird. Like, sure. Yeah. yeah. How many dogs do you have? Only have two. Uh, combined, they weigh less than thirty pounds. It feels two little active dogs. It feels like they feel like twelve or eleven dogs sometimes. Um, they're tiny, but they're beastly. Uh, so yeah, we have two dogs. Dozer, uh, Dozer featured on the cover of uh, one of my earlier middle grade books, um, Voyage of the Dogs. So I feel that I should be able to write his dog food off on the taxes since he definitely featured in the book. Um, Amelia featured as a dog named Growler um, in, another, in another book, Weird Kid, because basically what she does most of the day, she just sits under furniture and growls at us. She likes to growl. Like, I mean, that's basically all Growler does. So the dogs have featured in the books. Um, I wish I could bring them out on school visits and things like that because they would love the attention. Um, when you're on a school visit, it's always good to bring some kind of prop to take the performance pressure off yourself. You know, if things aren't going well, just say, here, kids, here's a dog. You know, you've pretty much won the day. <laughs> You don't even have to prepare a presentation at that point if you've got. You no, know, I've been able to take them to a couple of book signings at bookstores, and I didn't even need to be there. Honestly, I could have just brought the dogs, dropped them off, put up a sign, say "Buy my book," and I think I would have been just as successful as I was with doing a reading and all that stuff. Well, sure, somebody might walk by you and not buy the book, but are they going to let down a dog? Oh, well, it's a dog with a little puppy face. There's dogs pretty much in all my books. At a certain point, I decided if you can have a dog in your book, why wouldn't you have a dog in your book? It's just like, it's like, it's like a story with like a bonus. There's a dog in it. Um, the dogs in my books never die. That's another, that's a, that's a, the one spoiler I always happily give readers because I get asked, people are concerned, and they're usually really fun to tell them. I will never kill a dog in my book because I'm not a monster. I'm I'm a, I'm a human. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not a monster. I'm not going to kill the dog in the book. Humans fine. Dogs absolutely not. Humans, I don't feel I owe them as much. Dogs are sacred. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm I. Humans die in my books. They do, uh, and I don't feel bad about it. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't live with myself if I killed a dog in my book and probably readers would come after me with the pitchforks and the torches and things like that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to risk that. I'm not going to risk that angry reaction. Do you get uh, reactions from readers about how excited and enthusiastic they are to have uh, a story with a dog in it? Oh yeah. It's, it's, I think it's the, the number one uh, loved feature of my books is the presence of dogs. Um, because people love dogs and they like reading about dogs. It's and then I'm a dog guy, so I, I get it. Uh, yeah, people seem. I sometimes get like, "How about cats?" You know, like I have nothing against cats. I don't really intellectually understand their psychology or how they work anatomically. I thought of getting a cat, but I found myself uh, looking on Google, like, "How do you carry a cat?" Because like, where's her center of gravity? Like. Where, where, where do you hold them? And when I realized that, like, yeah, the cats just confuse me, I thought like probably instead we should go in the dog direction. So uh, Norse mythology, uh, I know runs through a lot of your work. Uh, you, you've got your first novel uh, that was based on a short story that was also about, uh, featured heavily Norse mythology, yeah. right? Yeah, so the first, um, my first professionally published short story um, was about Ragnarok. Very different take. Um, it was called uh, Wolves Till the World Goes Down. Uh, that eventually became, uh, grew into my first novel, which was for adults, Norse Code. Uh, we had, when I was in fifth grade, we had one of those, uh, you know, uh, programs for kids who were thought to be smart. I mean, obviously, some errors in judgment were made when I was included in the program. Uh, but an author of 10 books, my friend. Uh, that, <laughs> I, I think we can say it's, it's safe to say that you are uh, intellectually gifted above average, at least. I'm verbal. I'll say I'm verbal. Um, 
but we had a, a little thing where they we would just have a unit on uh, mythology and it was just basically a teacher just reading us stories of mythology and the ones that gripped me were the Norse ones and I think that's because I grew up in Southern California which is a Mediterranean climate so the Roman and the Greek stuff it didn't seem like very exotic to me it just seemed like oh yeah that's you know that's, I'm very familiar with palm trees and like hot weather and I didn't seem that interesting to me where the Norse stuff that was exotic and interesting because it was snow and mountains and large trees that weren't palm trees uh and also just the the I remember the Norse book, uh, the Norse mythology book in the library that I checked out just had better illustrations than the Greek and the Roman stuff. So that stuck with me. I like that stuff. And then in college, I took a couple of classes that uh, were about the, you know, the Icelandic history and the Viking civilizations and the Norse stuff. So I thought at some point I'm going to do something with Norse mythology. And um, Wolves to, Wolves, Wolves to the World Goes Down was the first story I wrote that featured the Norse mythology. And I also love that so much of Norse mythology is centered on the prophecy of the end of the world and on disaster. And when you live in Southern California, that place is always on fire, or there's an earthquake, or there's a mudslide. It's, it, it is a natural, Los Angeles is a natural disaster in progress. So I really twigged on, I really related to the whole Ragnarok prophecy. I thought that was interesting. So there's a lot of themes. There's a lot of themes and um, settings and, and metaphors in Norse mythology that interest me. Um, I'm probably gonna have to wait another five or six or seven or eight books before I come back to it uh, because I don't wanna dip into that well too often. I probably dipped into it maybe enough. I felt justified because the other stuff was for adults. And this is the only Norse mythology I've written for middle graders, but I'm probably, I should probably step back from that for a while. Oh, without spoiling Fenris and Mott seems pretty open for a sequel. If it's a sequel to Fenris and Mott, and if there's demand, I mean, talking about the business of writing, uh, my contracts with HarperCollins are for single standalone books. So each book is a different story, different characters, completely different. Uh, <clears throat> You never know if Fenris and, Mott, uh, Fenris and Mott, uh sells, you know, cartons full and crates full and HarperCollins says like, yeah, we'd like to see a sequel. I would happily write one. I, I like to end my books so that they end, but that they do hint that there could be more story if somebody wanted to read it. So I'm totally open to the idea of writing another Norse mythology story in the Fenris and Mott universe. Um, but I'm also content to write other stuff, write other stories taking place in other stuff, other genres, other characters, other times, other settings.